students. We are much honored to have uh, Sir Michael Atia to visit our university and give a talk this afternoon. Sir Michael Atia is one of the most influential mathematicians of the 20th century, and he really needs no introduction. However, I would like to take this opportunity to tell our graduate students that if you get stuck with your thesis work, try to read Sir Michael Atia's collected works for inspiration and encouragement. And that was what I did when I was a graduate student, and it really helped me then, at least psychologically. <laughs> um, Sir Michael Atia is an old friend of this university, and he has given quite a few wonderful lectures since he first visited us. Today's talk is about the geometry and topology of the fold and thel magic square. He will share his new insight into the Kovea environment one problem in this talk and the talk on next Monday. We will be very pleased but, and surprised, but not too surprised, that if this new insight of his eventually leads to an elegant solution of the Kovea environment one problem, which is so short so that it can be put on a postcard. Because he did this once with the Hopf environment one problem more than 40 years ago. On behalf of Professor Lee and the Institute for Advanced Study and HKUST Mathematics Department, let us welcome Sir Michael Atia. So I, I did that just, just now. I look, here is a copy of an old paper I wrote nearly 40 years ago. And I, I, I had difficulty following. I was a clever chap then, but as time passes, the earlier work gets, looks more and more difficult. <laughs> so. Um, now, I'm going to talk about informally about some problems which are um, well, currently being worked on. And it, it, it's, when I gave the title, I thought, well, I'm working on this problem, so it's nice to give the talk about what you're working on. And uh, if I'm lucky, I'll solve the problem, and then I can give the results. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always work out like that. I'm still stuck on the problem. Maybe this is the wrong way. I, anyway, it, it's good sometimes to talk about attempts which don't necessarily succeed. In mathematics, you try, and sometimes it succeeds, and it doesn't succeed, and you learn that way. Even if you fail to solve the problem, you learn something, even about your own weaknesses. So uh, this is a way of talking about mathematics that's currently going on, not yet completed, and perhaps some people in the audience can help me complete it, or give up, or go away and do it better themselves. So as the instruction said, now this, is this angle correct? How about the first? Is the first? Yeah, first one, not bad. So there are these two famous problems of algebraic topology, been around for a long time. The first one, well, they both have a similar title, but it's called the Hopf invariant one problem, which was solved by Frank Adams in the 1960s. Uh, very, very, very complicated uh, algebraic topology machinery, and the Kevarian invariant problem, which is much uh, been around also a long time, and was solved only this year by Mike Hopkins and his collaborators. Um, now, as we mentioned, the, Kevarian, the Hopf invariant one problem, uh, I managed to find a very, very simple solution. I said it could be written on a postcard, and it really can be written on a postcard. It depends on what you know before you start writing the postcard. But it, it's, um, and in fact, we, I wrote a paper with Adams afterwards where we published it. Um, and uh, so part of the idea of looking at this investigation is to see whether the, that is a simpler solution uh, of the Hopkins work, covariant pro pro problem. Um, also, their work is incomplete in some respects, and I wanted to, we wanted to complete it. In fact, that, that was the first thing I was trying to do. So, this is the aim, and I'm going to start talking about the uh, Hopf invariant problem as a preparatory to the second one. Now, the, the ingredients in this, the things that I will mention, is projective geometry, elementary projective geometry, a little bit about Lie groups, in particular the exceptional Lie groups, division algebras, some K theory which was used, some algebraic geometry which is used. So a lot of things come in, and they add to the interest of the subject. So let me start with projective geometry. So projective planes, the lowest dimension. And let me start just a good, a good example is the complex projective plane. The complex projective plane. Uh, is a four-dimensional real manifold. 
and its topology is, is quite simple. It contains complex straight lines, which are topologically two-dimensional spheres. And if you remove a, a line, you think of it as a line of infinity, what is left is the affine space, or if you think of an origin, that's the vector space uh, dimension two of the complex numbers. Um, if you, in between this point and the complex line, you insert a sort of three-dimensional common boundary. You can think of it as a three-dimensional sphere of unit sphere in the uh, complex vector space with that point as origin. Then you go to infinity and you make it larger and larger, if you like, it becomes a little, the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of the line of infinity. And that second description gives you the famous Hopf vibration that projects the three-dimensional sphere onto the complex vector line, and the fibers are all circles. So given the, the circle acts on the three sphere as a complex number of absolute value one, when you factor that out, by definition, essentially you get the complex vector line. Now this, this uh, map is called the Hopf vibration, like many things in mathematics, that's an incorrect terminology. This was actually discovered by Clifford long before Hopf, but unfortunately, wrong terminology sometimes gets stuck. It's called the Hopf vibration, it's too late, but they were discovered by Clifford, a brilliant mathematician who died young in the 19th century. The, one of the interesting things about this vibration is you take the three, any two fibers, any th these two points which are inverse images of two points on the two sphere below, on the three sphere, what they are are great circles. Uh, so, for example, the three sphere is a unit sphere of four-dimensional space. One equ sort of equatorial plane will give you one circle, an orthogonal one will give you the other circle, and those two circles are linked in the three sphere. They have linking number one. You can't pull them apart. Uh, so that's a very remarkable fact. And the, the fact that the linking number of two circles is one is actually closely related to the fact that um, two lines in the complex vector plane meet in one point, more or less the axiom of predictive geometry. Two points joined by a line, two lines meet in a point. That is the same statement as the statement that the circles are linked in linking number one. Um, now, this all has interpretation in, in topology, that topological language. The um, Hopf map gives you an element from the three-dimensional sphere to the two-sphere map, which defines, by definition, an element of the third homotopy group of the sphere, which is, in fact, infinite cyclic, generated by this map. If you, if you have a map between spheres, you can suspend the map. That's to say you add an, another north and south pole, increase the dimension of the sphere by one, and you can uh, map the new bigger sphere here to the bigger sphere there by copying what's happening on the other, at each level. So with this, this map, you can get a map of the four sphere to the three sphere, five sphere to the seven. And these, these maps, um, the homotopy groups, are known all to be equivalent. But on a certain point, they stabilize. That's what's called stable homotopy theory. In low dimensions, they can differ, but when you keep going, and this group here is the integers, but beyond this point, they are the integers modulo two. And that number, this mod, mod two number, is called the Hopf invariant in homotopy theory, and it plays an important role in the general theory of homotopy groups. So inside the complex vector plane, there is a nice little piece of basic topology, which has a big impact elsewhere. Now, there is a similar story for other predictive planes. So besides the complex numbers, you can take the quaternions. Those of you might have heard Simon Donaldson uh, earlier today, we heard him talking about the quaternions. The quaternions <coughs> are uh, a non commutative algebra of dimension 4 over the real numbers, and uh, you can form a plane, uh, you can form a quadratic space, quaternionic predictive space of any dimension, but in particular, you can form a plane, and the plane will be a very similar picture to the complex plane, except all the dimensions are doubled. The quaternions have dimension 4 over the real numbers, so the plane has dimension 8. Uh, inside that 8 dimensional plane, a quaternion line will be a four sphere, and the same picture before with the dimensions all increased. So similarly, that case gives rise to an element of the homotopy group of the phi 3 of S2. Now you get one phi 7 of S4. And again, that's infinite cyclic, and if you suspend by adding more dimensions, it becomes order 2. Same story, and this is again called the Hopf invariant in this dimension. The, these questions, there is also one to do with the Cayley plane. The Cayley plane is, uh, again, made of twice the dimensions, again, is built up of not the quaternions, but what are called the Cayley numbers, or the Arctonians, 
you want uniform notation. Um, and the octonians are generally have dimension 8 over the real numbers. Uh, so you go from complex uh, octonionic to Cayley's dimensions go 2, 4, 8. Um, the difference now is that the algebra you get is not even associative. When you go from the complex number to the quaternions, you lose commutativity. Sorry, you, yes, it becomes non-commutative. When you go to the Cayley plane, it gets worse. You lose non-associativity. People we don't usually like non-associative algebras, but it is, it is a good example. Um, one of the interesting things about the Cayley numbers is that you can manufacture the Cayley plane. Uh, and it, it's not so obvious how to do it because of non-associativity causes problems. Uh, and in fact, you can't make a Cayley Pythias space of dimension 3 or more. That's been known that if you can make a Pythias space of dimension 3 corresponding to a number system, that number system has to be associative. The associative law will follow from being in dimension 3. It doesn't um, stop you making in dimension 2. So dimension 2, it does exist for the Cayley plane alone. That's a rather... The other ones belong to families of Pythias spaces of all dimensions, the Cayley plane is unique to that dimension. Now, all these examples are also related to interesting fact about spheres, namely the, the, some spheres, S1, S3, and S7, are parallelizable. That means to say you can contract a system of um, vector fields which are linearly independent at every point. So the circle is obvious, you just go around the circle. Three spheres are not quite so obvious, but you can contract a frame of three vectors and move it around the sphere. Now, how can you move it around the sphere? Well, the point is that the three sphere is a group, which is the group of uniquaternions. So you give it at one point, you can simply apply the group, just like on a circle, you can rotate. That's applying the circle rotation. The well, seventh sphere is not quite a group because the algebra is not associative, but it's enough like a group that it enables you to construct parallelizable spheres because you, you, you can multiply by a, a variable element to a fixed element, and that action is still... Um, invertible and still gives you uh, a family of vector fields. Which are so you can construct parallelisms of the spheres uh, by using these algebras. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, the, the, these algebras uh, we have, whatever, whatever properties they have, they are examples of division algebras. That is to say, you multiply numbers together, like multiplication, and um, every element which is not zero has an inverse. So it means you can divide by a non-zero number. That's why they're called division algebras. Um, so X inverse exists, and that has the usual properties of an inverse. Um, algebras sometimes come with a norm. And the norm, in nice case, will have a property that so it's a positive number you associate every vector, not, not zero. And uh, the norm of X times Y is the norm of X times the norm of Y. And usually the norm is uh, the sum of the squares squares, some of the squares, the usual distance. Um, and that's true for the classical examples. Um, and that means that the elements of norm 1 uh, give you a sphere of dimension d minus 1, where d is the dimension of over the real numbers. And this property here, division algebra, is what makes the sphere parallelizable. It means that you, there is an inverse, so multiplying by x is a diffeomorphism, a one-to-one diff -one map differential of the sphere of, not, not, not if it's if it's normed, you can map on the unit sphere. If it's not normed, you do it on the non-zero vectors, more or less, and then you push it onto the sphere. So these algebraic properties are related to the uh, topological properties of parallelizability and to, uh, <laughs> well, uh, and to the problem I mentioned before, of the, the property of predictive planes, the key property you must remember is that they have lines, and two lines meet at one point. Now, the, the theorems about um, statement, are that the, these examples are the only ones. And diff there are different versions of the theorem, uh, depending on what strength. The, the fact that only, only norm and division algebra are these is a bit of algebra. You, you write down the uh, norm equations and you check it, and uh, algebraic calculation, you'll find these are the only normed algebras. Um, the fact that these are the only parallelizable spheres uh, is not so obvious. It's a d more difficult topological theorem only prove much later. Um, uh, you, if you have a normed algebra, then you can construct these parallelisms by linear algebra methods, the vector fields. 
But if you ask whether there are simply continuous vector fields constructed by any continuous function, that's a harder question. The answer is there aren't any, except the ones which you can construct by linear methods. So that's a significant theorem. And similarly, you can ask the question um, that is the projective plane, uh, we have the property, as I said, they contain lines, and two lines meet in one point. The line is half the dimension. And so you can look at the homology of the projective plane, or the cohomology of the projective plane. It has generators in dimension zero for a point, d in the middle dimension, and 2d in the highest dimension. And the property of two lines meeting in one point, you can convert, if you like, into cohomology that says the cup squares of the element in dimension d is the generator in dimension 2d. And then you can ask, are there other topological um, manifolds uh, which have those properties in cohomology. But this is a question of only what people might call a homotopy predictive plane, a plane whose top topological properties are like those of predictive planes, but that you don't necessarily have the geometry of lines, some only homological properties. Um, but the key property is that two lines meet in one point. Well, uh, you can convert that into a very ver concrete version. Take uh, your manifold, two dimension 2D that you're looking for, you think of it as being built out of, first of all, uh, a sphere of dimension d in the middle dimension, then you attach to that sphere of the middle dimension the cell of maximum dimension e2d, and you attach it by the map of the boundary of the cell, which is a sphere of dimension 2d minus 1, onto the sphere of dimension d. That attaching map in the example, classical example, is the Hopf map. Three sphere to two sphere, seven sphere, four sphere, and so on. So the question is, can you find a map from appropriate spheres, in other words, in that homotopy group uh, I've written down there, so that what you construct here has the cohomology uh, I, I described generated by element x in dimension d and squared in dimension 2d. And uh, we, I've written only mod 2 cohomology, although it's true with integer cohomology, in the examples I mentioned, uh, complex numbers, <laughs> Quaternions, and Cayley numbers, but in fact, it's also true for the real vector plane, more elementary still, except there that the intersection numbers only count modulo 2 because there are orientability questions. Uh, and so you work with mod, the mod 2 cohomology of the vector plane has the same structure generated in dimensions 0, 1, and 2. The square dimension 1 is the one in dimension 2. So the, all the four planes are examples of this kind. And the question, natural question asked by topologists, are there any other manifold? Uh, uh, with this topological property. Of course, this is the strongest theorem of all. If you can prove that one, then you prove all, most all other ones follow, because this is the, the strongest theorem of this type. This was the theorem that Adams proved um, a long time ago. Um, and he proved it by um, very sophisticated methods. I won't go into the methods, except they, they involve um, co cohomology groups, cohomology ring, and then there are what are called cohomology operations, things that operate naturally on cohomology, and then these operations themselves, you can write them down as a set of generators. There are relations between them, and then further on there are things called secondary operations, which are defined on the kernel of the primary operation. And it's a very complicated story. And he used this powerful machine, and I wrote a 100-page paper in the Annals of Mathematics, which proved the theorem after many, many years. It was a good tour de force. Then a short while later, um, we th people were thinking about it from other points of view, and I came up with this K-theory proof, which is a little postcard. Well, I put it on a transparency here, but with better magnification, it would go on a postcard. Um, now, the proof requires not basic knowledge of K-theory, but um, all the properties of K-theory that one needs are quite elementary, with the fun one exception of the fundamental theorem, which is the Bott periodicity theorem. Now, I, I won't try to... Those of you who know what K-theory is will follow. Those who don't can see at least it's a short proof. Um, the Bott periodicity theorem is a famous theorem that says, in this case, that the unity groups um, of a large dimension have um, homotopy only in every second dimension when it's an even where it's integers. So the unity group uh, homotopy in dimension one, three, five, and so on. Um, and not only are they periodic, but there actually is a very beautiful structure to that periodicity. And that once you've got that theorem then you can generate this machinery and you can construct something that's called the K-theory of a space, which is very similar to the cohomology, but it has additional refinement. Well, first of all, the most important refinement it has is that the 
K theory, which looks uh, like the even cohomology. So the space like we're talking about, it will have three generators. Um, but unlike the cohomology, it's not graded. It doesn't consist of something in dimension zero, something in dimension two, something in dimension four, or something. It is filtered. You, see? you can talk about things which sort of include, correspond to the all the dimensions beyond a certain point. And if you have a thing which is filtered that way, then if you take one level of filtration, factor it by the next one, you'll get something graded. And the theorem is that the K theory is filtered, and the associated graded object is the cohomology ring. So it's it contains more information than the cohomology ring, uh, in this case, um, because you can deduce the all the properties of the cohomology from it, but this filtration is a little bit stronger, because it links together different dimensions. That's the one important difference. And secondly, it contains, has some operations, which ironically are called Adam's operations, uh, because Adam's later on got to use these, um, although they were known before Adam's. Uh, and these operations are really very simple operations. What they are, there is one defined for each integer k, called psi k, and they are operations that act universally in all the k theory, k groups of any space, and they are, have two beautiful, well, three beautiful properties. First, they are ring homomorphic. K theory is a ring. This preserves addition and multiplication, which is very unusual for operations of this kind. And secondly, if you look at something in, uh, which is in a fixed filtration, uh, which will give rise to cohomology in that dimension, then the action of the Adam's operation of psi k is, begins, looks like k to the power n if you're in dimension 2n. So that, with that, all these are very simple to prove because these, this, these construction of these psi comes out of fairly elementary algebra of symmetric functions and uh, representation of the linear, linear group. Um, so now the, the claim is that with these operations, we look at the problem, can you find a space which looks like a fixed plane, uh, just from the point of view of uh, the cohomology? Well, first of all is that the um, K theory and cohomology are so close that the assumption about cohomology leads to a similar assumption about the K theory. In other words, the K theory of a space of dimension 2D will have a part corresponding to dimension 0, which we get rid of. It just corresponds to the, the unit of the ring, and then the rest of it called K tilde. Then there'll be two generators, A, which is the one that belongs to the middle dimension, and B, which is the one corresponding to the highest dimension. But this time they're linked. And the link is still, it's still that, like, like in the other case, you assume that A squared gives you essentially B. So you're making more or less the same assumptions as before. And now we, you, we now um, compute with these psi's, and we just a little calculation, we're using psi 2 and psi 3. Uh, by the way, another property I should have mentioned about the psi Adam's operation, they commute amongst themselves. It's like all the psi's case, they form a community like ring. Um, by the way, this, those of you are interested, this is, these are, have some relationship with the Frobenius automorphism and the characteristic P and a lot of nice, very natural properties. The, um, now, I'll, I'll, for the purpose of this argument, I'll assume D, D was the middle dimension, and so uh, it would, D equals 1 would be the real predictive plane, but that's, we, we know all about that one, so we assume it's not uh, 1. And if it, also the next thing you can get deduced is that D has to be even. Um, and, uh, and that is that, well, if, if D was odd, then squares, uh, because of the anti-commutative law of multiplication, you get 2x squared equal to 0. This space has no torsion, so that would imply. So th 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 we can assume without lots of generality the number D is even. And so we take it to the P of the form 2n. Now you do this little bit of calculation. Oh, let's see if I can do it in my head with you. So you, apply, you take A and B, and we apply psi 2 and psi 3 to them. So you write down psi 2 of A. So it, start, what it, it starts off as 2 to the n times A, because that, that's the one of the rules. That, uh, but then plus something you don't know in, in, in higher up. So some multiple of B. Similarly, psi 3 will be 3 to the power n times A, plus another multiple of B. So those are just general facts. We know about that. Now, psi 2 of B is... 2 to the power 2n times b, plus higher up, but there's no higher up. It stops there, so that's all you get. Similarly, psi 3 of b. So these, we have these uh, four equations. And now we observe that we can apply, go on, apply psi 3 to psi 2, or pi, psi 2 to psi 3, and they commute. So doing that, you'll get some identities. So here's the identities. You do that, and you get this equation. And if you believe me, and you go down, you get this one. 
Now, this one here is the important conclusion. What it says is that the numbers mu and nu are related by this nice formula, the powers of three, c to the n, c to the n minus one, two to the n, two to the n minus one. Looks very harmless. Now, the point is, we're trying to prove that there is no element of Hopf invariant one except in the dimensions we've got. So we assume that we have, in other words, that amounts to assuming that the uh, number mu here is odd, basically. That's the one that corresponds to saying that the, uh, psi, or I should say, psi 2 is a bit like a, a square, you see. So a, psi 2, uh, on here, this one, is, the, the fact that this is to be uh, odd is the statement that the square of the middle generated cohomology is, is, is mod 2 equals the top generator. So mu odd is what you're assuming um, and try and deduce that the dimension n has to be one of the numbers we know about. So you put it, plug it in. If, if mu is odd, then 2 to the nth on this side has to divide c to the nth times c to the n minus 1. Well, it can't divide c to the nth, so it divides c to the n minus 1. Now you do a little bit of elementary arithmetic, and you can deduce from this that if n to the n divides that, n must be 1, 2, or 4. So the calculation at the bottom, if you want to check, if you can't, don't believe me. Uh, it's pretty clear that uh, the first few cases are quick, all right, and one of these things grows much faster than the other, so it's impossible. To have. So it's a trivial calculation from these elementary properties, and that's the postcard proof. So very nice when you can get a, a deep theorem in topology coming out of a very elementary application of a nice piece of machinery. This case theory machinery was fairly new at the time, and so we applied it, and there, there's its application. So it's a, it, I still think it's my shortest, best proof. Uh, I mean, I think you, proof shortness is not, uh, not, not the only merit theory we should have, but it, it's a very important one. A nice short proof is something you really uh, should focus on. Now, um, this was the prepared, this is the example we've done in the past. I don't want to get on to, get on to the, the future in a way, but in the, in the intermediate, the, the kind of halfway stage, I'm going to talk about the contents of this famous paper of mine that I just told you about, um, which uh, I was rereading. The title of the paper is called Riemann Surfaces and Spin Structures. And I'll tell you a bit about it because it's the introduction to the second lecture. The second lecture will be more complicated, but this is a partial introduction. So the, this is the first off, we start off with an ele elementary facts about quadratic forms over the field of character two, or the field of two elements, let's say, and something called the Arf invariant. Uh, I, I'll probably get it wrong. Uh, what is, uh, what exactly, whether the Arf invariant is zero or one, but never mind, we'll, we'll sort that out later. Um, over the field of two elements, um, the t two special things happen. First of all, symmetry and skew symmetry are the same. In my, my, there are a few two elements, plus one is equal to minus one. So uh, usually we distinguish between the symmetric and skew symmetric matrices, for example. One corresponds to the orthogonal group and the others. So the, there are very, in case two, they're the same. So that's the first important difference. Secondly, there is a difference between quadratic functions and symmetric non-degenerate bilinear form pairings. Usually you know when you write down a symmetric matrix, uh, it gives you a quadratic form, and you go from one to the other, but on, on the way, you have to, uh, so the fact that two appears. The off-diagonal term gets, um, you have to divide by two, go backwards or forwards, and you can't do that in characteristic two. So you have to distinguish between um, quadratic functions, I'll define exactly what I mean by quadratic function, and uh, symmetric bilinear forms. And including, in roughly speaking, that given the bilinear form, there are two possible quadratic forms, and they're distinguished. Uh, by what's called the Arf invariant, which by definition is zero for one and one for the other, but I'll get them mixed up. Um, now, you can define th this um, theory for, uh, for a vector space over the field of two elements, but actually it turns out it's better to work with affine spaces. Uh, an affine space is just a vector space with the origin not being distinguished. But in some ways, uh, it's better to do that, both because it's, it shows the inherent it shows independence of the choice of origin. And secondly, in some of the applications, uh, we naturally meet affine spaces, not vector spaces. And if you go back to elementary geometry, elementary geometry, for example, in the plane, if I have a plane here, 
I don't have a third point anywhere. I mean, I put a point, call it a vector space, but what you get in the plane here has an affine plane. Okay, so it's a plane with no preferred origin. You can translate an affine plane. You can move it this way and you can move it that way. And the translations form a vector space. And the vector space is isomorphic to the plane once you've chosen the origin. So you should distinguish between the affine plane, which has no, not, a, no, not a group structure, and no origin, and the translations, which act on that space. So I'll do that. Um, now, so he, if you have a, a little picture, there's meant to be a little picture. In dimension two, as I was talking about, the affine plane, here's the ordinary plane. And for example, if you want to talk about a linear map from the affine plane to the affine line, the affine line, again, is just a line with no, no, no preferred origin, then you just what you're doing is you're projecting the plane onto the line. And projecting means you just draw parallel lines. And parallel lines you can certainly draw in, in affine geometry. They don't need an origin. So but a linear map is just a, a sort of parallel projection. Right. Uh, <coughs> over, and that can be defined. Um, over, over two points, field of two points, of course, I can't draw a picture that doesn't look like that because the plane only has four points and the line only has two points. So here is a picture of the projection of the affine plane onto the affine line. You have four points, and you have to map them onto the two points in the appropriate linear fashion. Uh, anyway, that's, that's, that's getting us started. Now, the affine space of dimension n over the other two elements, uh, well, that's about two to the end of the element point, that has associated a vector space of translations, as I mentioned. Um, and if you want to have a notation, if you want to act by a translation on a point in the space, you would normally have some notation saying element acts on the point by putting a bracket or something. I will use a simpler notation. I'll just write it as a plus. So if x is a translation and a is a point in the plane, I'll write x plus a for the effect. I could have written x bracket a. But th this is better because this plus sign will have the usual properties of plus, and it, but it, it, it makes perfectly good sense. So you can define the adding translation to a point. Uh, <coughs> now, if A and B are two points in the plane. You can't add them, but you can take their difference because you can get from one to the other by a unique translation. So the difference of two points in the plane is a translation. But the difference, well, I mean, Minus is the same as plus, you see here, so I can still call it plus. So although you can't add them, you can subtract, and that's the same thing. So you can talk, you can write a plus b. So any two points, but a plus b is not another point in the plane, it is translation. So very simple rule, but quite useful to remember. And by the way, if you want to see why, um, for example, what a linear map from uh, an to a1, an affine linear map, uh, that algebraically, if you want to define it, I'd draw a picture. But if you want to write a formula, you would write it like this. L of x plus a, that means the action of x on a, plus L of a, I'm allowed to add two points and get a translation. And what translation do I get? I get a translation which I'll call L of x. Uh, um, well, what you prove is, of course, that this number here is independent of a, so it makes sense to call it L of x. And what you defined is... Um, 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 a point in the one-dimensional vector space uh, derived from applying a linear map to uh, <coughs> this, is a, this is a projection from vector space to a vector space. Um, and that, if you want to verify the rules here, it just corresponds to a parallelogram like this. If you've got a point A, shifted by X, and if you've got a point B, shifted by X, and these, this forms a parallelogram. So the shift from here to here is independent of A, that's what they call L of X. So you can prove all these things by drawing pictures. That's going back to basic projective geometry. Um, now, let's start. The next important thing, we want to talk about quadratic functions. So what is a quadratic function? So a quadratic function, well, I'll call it a quadratic map. So it's a map, like a linear map, but a map from the affine line plane to the affine end space to the affine line. A quadratic map, it's map Q from the affine plane to the affine line. And here's the defining property of a quadratic map. So what we do, we, we apply Q to X plus A, applied to A, X plus Y, applied to A, plus Q of A, or if you like, minus Q of A, 
And the results of that, well, how does it, does it depend on x and y separately? Well, it, it, it's equal to q of x plus a plus q of y plus, plus a, which would be what you would have is linear, but then you have this cross term, x in a product y, um, uh, x and y being two translations, we're assuming that we have a, in the space of translations a fixed inner product. And this is the cross term. So think of this as squaring, quadratic function is squared. Th this squared is equal to that squared plus that squared plus the cross term. So this is defined, so this is um, the bilinear form, and this is a quadratic function associated with the bilinear form. And uh, this holds in the translations on the line, which is just z2. So <coughs> all of these things at the end, the end lie inside the field of two elements. Now, if you put y equal to x in that formula, uh, then you will see that things cancel out, um, and it implies that xx is 0 for all x. And in fact, if you have a bilinear form uh, for field of two elements, it doesn't have to have this property in, ca in, in category 2. And if it has that property, you call it an even form. And only, only, e only the bilinear forms with this property for which there is a quadratic function. Um, and then when, when that's the case, then this bilinear form can be put into the standard form, matrix form, and it can put it into be the form even number of dimensions. You have a unit matrix in the area there, and this is something called the Lagrangian subspace. It is because on that subspace, the form identity is zero. It's copied from the notation in symplectic geometry because I said symmetric and skew-symmetric are the same. Um, now, the question is, given a, a bilinear form of this kind, um, we define what is a quadratic or quadratic map, uh, how many are there? So is there one, two, or more? Well, at this level for this question, be very careful, the answer is it's unique. There's one and only one quadratic map in the affine case for a given bilinear form. Um, now, what does that mean? Uh, up to isomorphism, okay? All things in the world are up to isomorphism. But you have to be careful what kind of isomorphism you use. Now, if you're mapping an affine line, affine plane, affine end space to an affine line, the symmetries in question are the translations on both sides. So what it means is that up to translating in the affine space by something and in the uh, line by something, you will convert one quadratic map into the other. Now, how do these actions uh, behave? Um, well, I think you can write the formula down. You have to be careful. There are two actions, one of which is the translation on the affine space, and you apply the, quad the quadratic map then. Then after that, you're in the image space, and then you can shift it there too. So you apply left and right, if you like. The actions are two different um, translations, the translation of the line and the tra translation on the original space. Now, Although there is a unique, unique quadratic map, uh, the important thing is this quadratic map, which maps, you really don't forget, into the um, affine line over the field of two elements that has just two points. Not, don't call them 0 and 1 because they don't, you haven't chosen 0 yet. There are two points. And in fact, you can translate one into the other by adding 1 for translation. Um, and the answer, but it is true that this quadratic map, uh, you can look at the two the inverse images of these two points. They are given, if you like, by the equation q of x equals something, q of x equals the other one. And so those you can be thought of as affine quadrics. They're quadratics given by equation. And th these two, the important thing is, they don't have the same number of points in them. So the total number of points in affine n space is 2 to the nth. But these two quadrics have to share, share the points between them, and they don't share them equally. One takes more than the other. And the two numbers, in fact, are, I think I've got it wrong here. Uh, too many, yeah. Um, the number of points is 2 to the mth, if my notation is correct. And what you get is 2 to the m minus 1. And here you have 2 to the m minus 1 plus 1, 2 to the m minus 1 minus 1. If you add them together, these cancel, and you get all together 2 to the mth points. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So the, the, there is this difference in cardinality, and the, therefore the two things are, are different. Um, now, that means that um, if you actually don't want to, don't, you want to fix out the origin in the, in the affine line, 
uh, and distinguish zero and one, then the two quadratics will be different. So well, the, you can translate in the original space, but if you don't allow yourself translation in the image space, you'll have two answers. So the answer is, depends on which isomorphism you use. So the unique one, if, the, if everything is affine, but the, there's two. And so I'll distinguish a quadratic function from a quadratic map. Quadratic map maps you onto a line. Quadratic function maps you to the field. In a field, you have zero. And so you can distinguish the two quadratic functions by asking how many, what is the cardinality of the points between the zero or one. And those, those, those are the two quadratic functions. And the half invariant distinguishes between the two. Now, they're invented, this theory goes back to a Turkish mathematician called Kayet Arf, uh, and he I can't know what, decided which, which was zero and which was one. And I, I, I found I was getting them mixed up. So don't, let, don't let's worry for the moment. The important thing are these two different quadratic uh, functions, and they have different numbers of zeros. So that's the important point. Right. So this, I, I was making heavy weather of it because I wanted to use the affine spaces, not just the vector spaces, but the payoff comes when you come to apply it. You'll find it later on that pays, pays off. So here I'm just summarizing what I said. Given the quadratic form, that is the bilinear form, there are two quadratic functions, and they distinguish by the number of points in the image of one or zero, uh, and one of them is half invariant one, and one of them is half invariant zero. And I think they're the wrong way around, but let's not worry just now. Uh, <coughs> and so the, this is what I was just saying, the up to translation in the affine space, these are the two possibilities. If you translate in the image space, then you're allowed to shift to zero, then you go just, you replace Q by, by Q plus one. That changes from one to the other. So then, of course, you interchange these two. But if you want, if, you, if the image space is definitely a vector space, then you have distinguished um, cho choices. Now, so that was just to summarize elementary properties about quadratic forms, quadratic functions, um, over the field of two elements. And this is a nice little story. Now, now I want to introduce the Riemann surface story, which is the content of this paper of mine. Um, so, and this is a very classical theory in its own right. It goes back to Riemann himself, I think. So, not, not, not just the theory of Riemann surfaces, but the, the problem I'm going to talk about. The Riemann surfaces, well, we have a Riemann surface, uh, <coughs> let's say xg of genus g, a thing with g holes. Um, the cohomology of uh, Riemann surface in dimension 1 with mod 2 coefficients <coughs> gives a vector space over the field of two elements with a bilinear form given by the cup product uh, and the, the rank of this dimension of this group is 2G. Um, notice also that the first cohomology with mod 2 coefficients is the same as mapping the homomorphism of the fundamental group into the group of two elements. They give you rise to flat line bundles of order 2 on the Riemann surface. And if you fix, if you fix a complex structure on the Riemann surface, the Riemann surface at the moment, first of all, is just topological. But if you fix a complex structure, then a flat line bundle of order 2 becomes a holomorphic line bundle of order 2. <coughs> or <when> you, <coughs> a flat line bundle here is a real line bundle, you complexify it, and you get a holomorphic structure. And so the, the holomorphic line bundles of um, order 2 on the Riemann surface are well, traditionally, they're also related to divisor classes of order, order 2, and there are exactly 2 to the 2G two, two two of them. So the, the, uh, now, the, on the Riemann surface, there is, of course, the canonical line bundle. That's the line bundle corresponding to the canonical class. Its degree is 2G minus 2, uh, and you call it the, the points give you what's called the canonical uh, divisors. Um, now, this number is even, 2G minus 2, and therefore, it's topologically possible to extract a square root to find a line bundle whose square is this one. The line bundle will have degree g minus 1. So suppose you consider a square root of this, call it L, and now I ask how many square roots there are. But if you go to the point of view of divisors, it's like asking, taking a canonical divisor and taking half the canonical divisor, finding a divisor half as many points. And you ask how many divisor classes there are. Now, the set of all such square roots up to isomorphism, if you've got a square root of that one, you can multiply by a square root of one, or if you like, by divisor of order zero, two. And that gives you another, another solution. 
and all the solutions are obtained in that way. So in other words, the set of line bundles in order two, which effect effectively is the first cohomology group, um, acts freely and transitively on the space of square roots. So the space of square roots is naturally an affine space whose corresponding vector space is this group here. So it, there's no distinguished square root. So once you've got one, you get all the others by just tensoring with a, uh, a line bundle of order two. So you have a very natural example of an affine space um, of this thing, over the field of two elements with H1 as a space of translations. Now we have a, a theorem. This theorem, you say, goes back to Riemann in one form or another. Didn't talk about line bundles, but he talked about divisor classes only. There's the following. Let us look at the function, the space of holomorphic sections of this line bundle with for a fixed complex structure, Riemann surface, um, and take its dimension modulo 2. Now vary the complex structure. And the theorem is that this does not change as you vary the complex structure. It depends only on the topology. Um, and what it is, this function modulo 2 is a quadratic function on the set of square roots uh, with, well, I think that's the wrong way around, but one important thing is a quadratic function that we, we know when it takes the value 0 and 1, which one corresponds to the uh, bigger one and which corresponds to the smaller one. So we can, we can work out which one it is. But it is a quadratic function of the type we're talking about, and it naturally occurs on the affine space, and it depends on no choices. You see, if you, if you work with vector space, you've made some choice, you have to show it independent of the choice. This is naturally given as the dimension of the space of sections. Now, as you, as you, if you take a Riemann surface and look at it such a square root, then generic Riemann surfaces, the dimension uh, may be 0 or 1. Either it has a section or it doesn't have a section. It doesn't usually have more than one. But if special ones, the dimension actually may be bigger. Uh, for very special ones, it may be large. So it, but if it's one originally and you vary it, it can be, next one it can jump to three, it can jump to five. But it can't uh, change from odd to even. So that's the theorem which, say, goes back to Riemann. In fact, this paper has an interesting origin because David Mumford was studying this, the subject, looking at it from a modern point of view, and he asked me, uh, he knew what I'd been doing, he asked me if I could somehow see how to put it into modern language and give a modern proof. And that's what I, this paper was about. So here is a sketch of the proof. Uh, it's a sketch because I didn't have time to read the paper in full before I gave the lecture. And anyway, it's not, you can't give it all in a few minutes. But it's pretty, the idea is pretty simple. And the idea is that the, uh, we put this into the context of index theory of elliptic operators. Now, that's a big mouthful to take all at once. But um, the important, first of all, the following observation. Uh, a spin structure on a Riemann surface, um, well, I, I talked about the square roots of the, of the canonical line bundle. And the statement is that this is the same as the set of spin structures. A spin structure on a manifold is when you lift the structure group of the tangent bundle from the orthogonal group, special orthogonal group, to its double covering. Then when, once you've chosen that choice, you have a spin manifold. And the advantage of a spin manifold, for example, is that you can talk about spinner fields. Physicists always do. The universe has to be spin manifold for a physicist to begin. Um, so you have, and on, on the spinner fields, you have the Dirac operator that Dirac introduced. So spin manifolds are nice because they have this fundamental operator, if you choose a metric, the Dirac operator. Um, now, it, it, depending on the dimension of the space, the Dirac operators have different properties. If the dimension of the space um, is, um, well, depending whether I'm working with real or common, it, it, let's say to be safe, divisible by eight, then the Dirac operator <coughs> has an instinct index, which is a topological invariant, which is a formula, or also divisible by four. Um, but in dimensions which are, for example, one and two mod eight, uh, it, it doesn't have that property. There is no the operator is not does not have an index because it's a self adjoined operator or something like that. But in dimensions one and two, there is a mod two invariant, uh, which is a, is a, plays the role of an index in the following sense: the index theory is related to K theory, which is related to the Bott periodicity theorem. The Bott periodicity theorem are about the homotopy groups of the classical groups. The complex case leads you to the unitary groups. The real case leads you to the orthogonal group. And the orthogonal group has uh, is homotopy groups are periodic with period eight. 
Uh, and the period, there are two Z2s, two groups order two. <coughs> me. Um, every fourth one is integers, and there's some zeros. They, they have a very simple origin. <coughs> the first Z2 comes from the two components of the orthogonal group, the distinction between ortho oriented and unoriented. The second Z2 comes from the difference between the orthogonal group and the spin group, the double covering. <coughs> and it's the second one that's relevant in our case. So in dimensions uh, mod 2, the spin structure allows you to introduce the Dirac operator. <coughs> and then if you look at the space of solutions of the Dirac op operator, that's a certain finite dimensional space on the manifold, its dimension, as you vary the metric, can jump around, but its parity does not. The, 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 the parity does not change, and that's called the mod 2 index. It's related to the mod 2 in the periodicity theorem. Uh, and roughly speaking, it arises from the following fact. Uh, the, the Dirac operators in these dimensions are uh, something like self adjoint or skew adjoint. And uh, the index compares an operator with its adjoint. But if the operator is self adjoint or skew adjoint, the ad operator and its adjoint have the same number of solutions, so the difference will give you nothing. But if you look more carefully, when the operator is, for example, self adjoint or skew adjoint, it will have eigenvalues. And as you vary the background metric, the eigenvalues will, can move around in general, so the zero eigenvalue can jump. But what happens is that in the case of these, for example, uh, self adjoint, the operators come in pairs, uh, one plus one minus one, and when they go to zero, um, they both go to zero. So the, if they increase the zero by one, you increase it by two. So for that reason, mod two, the parity, uh, is topological, doesn't de depend on the metric. But this is a very nice subtle point about the Dirac operators, which leads you to mod 2 invariance. It's, it's, not a, it's not an invariant that you can calculate very easily um, when you have to solve some problem, but it, what you do know is that it's topological. Uh, and it's, it's defined on the set of spin structures of any, any manifold of dimension 8k plus 2, you have such a story, particularly simple with the manifold of dimension 2. And in that case, in the manifold of dimension 2, you can, if you think of it carefully, you can see the spin structure is exactly the same as the set of these square roots that I was talking about. So that's why we embed this um, classical story of Riemann into the modern theory. We can apply it to manifolds of dimension uh, 2 and then 10 and uh, higher up. Always get the same story, the Dirac operator, mod 2 index. And, <coughs> and now the question is, uh, so we get a topological invariant. The theorem that I mentioned before says that we have a, a variant. I've now relabeled it, put it in a context, but it also is independent of the complex well, independent of the metric, or the complex structure, and it's a quadratic function. Now, why is it a quadratic function? And which quadratic function is it? It's a quadratic function, of course, related to the cup product of the bilinear pairing. Now, uh, why, is it, why is it a quadratic function? Well, the answer is, it, it, I'm going to sketch it here, but the following, very simple fact, really. Um, what is the nature of the, look, at the first thing you can do when you have the Dirac operator on such a manifold is you can extend it by, it acts originally on spinners, but you can extend it by tensoring those with any real vector bundle. We can call this the spinners with coefficients in the vector bundle. And you'll say the Dirac operator will extend to being a homomorphism of the group of all vector bundles, real vector bundles, onto Z2. The group of real vector bundles we call is the K theory, K, KO theory, the orthogonal group. So the, this mod 2 index becomes a homomorphism of this additive group of real vector bundles to Z2. Um, and now, more or less out of the, out of, uh, just the algebraic properties of this thing, we can deduce that this has to be a quadratic function. And the reason is simply the following. Um, we got it, this is a ring, it's a commutative ring, um, and because x is dimension 2, uh, if we think in here that the ring, the elements of augmentation 0, let's say we, we don't start with a constant term, um, so this 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 will be a... Uh, have parts corresponding to dimension 1, dimension 2. If you take the, the augmentation ideal of this thing and you cube it, it has to be zero for dimensional reasons. You're outside the, the game. So basically, such a uh, cubes are zero. And that's why this thing has, has, well, it has to be quadratic. The point is, this is originally defined uh, on the vector space we were thinking about, or the affine space, was the um, corresponding to the line bundles in this space, square roots. Trivial bundle. They are in the multiplicative group 
of this ring. And um, you, when you embed the multiplicative group of a ring into a whole ring, think of it additively, uh, then you're going to get a, you, in this case, you'll get a quadratic map automatically. Basically, you have a line bundle L1 and L2, and take that, that, that tensor product in the Roman line bundle, you L1 tends to L2. But this multiplicative group is embedded in this linear space, not linearly, it's embedded curved. So L1 and L2 and L1 tends to L2, uh, are, one is not the sum of the others, so there's a difference, and that difference has to be quadratic. So you, you get the, the quadratic nature more or less for free um, out of the algebraic structures of this thing. With a bit more work, you find also the uh, pairing is, is given by the cut product. And with a bit more work, you identify which of the two quadratic functions it is and uh, <coughs> distinguishes, uh, gives it uniquely. So this is the, the content of this little paper of mine, and if you're interested in the details, you can read it. It's all fairly simple from once you assume you know the basic properties of the case that goes into it. So it's a very nice story about uh, Riemann surfaces and mod 2 invariants and these uh, quadratic forms. Um, and let me get, finish with giving you the examples of for the first few cases. So if you take the case of genus 1, if you get so the genus 1, that means you have a dealing with an elliptic curve, or if you like, a torus. Um, there are four, like, the, the, in that case, the canonical bundle is actually trivial. So the, the, the canonical divisor is zero. So the four uh, square roots of the canonical bundle, or if you like, of the four uh, divisors, classes of order 2, they are the four points on the torus, uh, which appear in 2. One is distinguished, it's the origin. In this case, we have an origin. The other three are, are, are different. And that's th this division of 4 into 1 plus 3 is that unequal distribution uh, we had before but in the general case. And notice that the trivial uh, line bundle has a holomorphic section, trivial, you can take the constant section. The non-trivial line bundles, which are ordered to, have no holomorphic sections. If they had, they would correspond to an effective divisor and they don't. So this is the one that has so the quadratic function in this case, um, has um, takes the value of 1, once, it takes the value zero three times. That tells you which of the two it is. If you replace the quadratic function by q plus one, you can switch them around. They, they take a more interesting example, genus three. Genus three curves are usually, um, can be represented in the plane as plane cortex. In this case, the cortex, the, the lines that meet the curve, cut out the conical divisor, which has now degree four. And so, if you have a line in the plane, that is a bitangent, that means it touches the curve at two points, it's called a bitangent, then the two points, counted with multiplicity two, belong to the canonical system. Therefore, the two points without the multiplicity one is half the canonical system. So we find, we see here that the, the square roots of the effective device, we find 28 of them, because the, 20, the number of bitangents of a plane quartic is very famous theorem, classical effective geometry is 28. 28 is a very beautiful number. It's, it's, related, it's related to the exceptional group E6 and all sorts of other interesting things. Anyway, it, it, you have 28 bitangents. And by the way, uh, total number of points in this case is, is the right part of 2, 64. So the two numbers in question are 28 and 36. 28 is the smaller of the two. Um, and the, the, the bitangents, they arise because the canonical, um, this, this half of the canonical divisor has, has two points. That means there is a cross section of that line bundle with two points. That means it, it are holomorphic sections. So there again, this one has holomorphic sections, and the other ones, well, don't, or at least this one has even odd number of sections, the other one has even number of sections. So this is the quadratic function takes the value one on these 28, uh, as it did in the other case. So the, and in general, the quadratic function gives you the value one on the smaller subset and the value zero on the larger subset. Whatever Arf said, that, that's all you need to know. Now, the, so, uh, so this is a very classical, beautiful uh, theorem, which gets uh, included and gives you a feeling of what these, um, this division in these two things is. And they, they're, they're rather nice things. Um, one last observation, and this also applies to the generalization I talked about, is this mod 2 invariant of the square roots. Um, Think of these square roots as being spin structures. Um, it, it is a spin, it 
it defines you, makes a spin. If you choose a point in here, it gives you a spin structure. It makes a manifold a spin manifold. Every Riemann surface is a spin manifold but in many ways. Um, and this quantity, mod, in, integer mod 2, is actually an example of a spin cobordism invariant. In other words, if you take a Riemann surface, here's a surface, and if it bounds a three dimensional manifold, for example, take the torus, take the interior, or any, any, any surface to fill it in, you have a three dimensional manifold with that boundary. Now, on the boundary, if you've chosen uh, such a square root spin structure, you could ask whether that spin structure extends to the interior. It doesn't automatically have to do so because there's a bit of topology involved. Okay? But if it does extend, that picks up the spin structure that bound. Uh, and other spin structure will not bound. It, it, and so the theorem is that this is a spin cobordism invariant. That means it will vanish on those which bound. And so, <coughs> in general, if two things bound the same thing, you give the same answer. And, and spin cobordism invariants are, are, are important as other, other, other um, cobordism invariants, different kinds, ordinary orthogonal group, unity group. The spin cobordism invariant is slightly more subtle. And this is a spin cobordism invariant. Um, and you can check. It's not entirely trivial. But if you take a torus, then we have these uh, four square roots, or four choices of S on the torus, one of which is the trivial uh, line bundle, and the other three are the non-trivial ones. And you can check which of these extends to the inside, topologically, and which doesn't. And the answer is surprising. Uh, why, well, it's not the one you expect. What's the one you expect? Well, uh, you'd think that the trivial line bundle would extend inside. Um, but you see the trivial line bundle, it, the value of this quantity function is 1. So it doesn't, it doesn't extend inside. That proves it. But you, you want to... Very, but the other ones do extend inside. It's a, actually the even more primitive or surprising version of this, which this can be deduced. If you go back to the circle, and there's a similar story on the circle with spin structures on the circle. Again, there are two spin structures on the circle, and one of them extends to the inside, and the other one doesn't. And again, it's the, it's, it's, it's the spin structure on the circle corresponds with double covering. Either double covering disconnected, or it's connected. And one of those extends to the inside, and the other one doesn't. So th th there are some nice, nice subtle features related to spin invariance, and these actually will play a role in the my second talk, because I'll be talking, well, and I could say that here and now, the, um, when I talked about the different versions of the Hopf invariant one problem, I mentioned a number of different bits of geometry, um, one of which was about the existence of certain kinds of manifolds, and the other was about uh, elements of homotopic groups of spheres. And there is a general uh, theory, which we'll, I'll talk about next time, which relates homotopic groups to manifolds and uh, what are called frame manifolds. And <coughs> so manifolds enter into the theory of uh, hom homotopy, and things like spin cobordism are part of that theory of manifolds, which is related to part of the theory of homotopy. So anyway, this was the first uh, lecture, which is, was a sort of warm-up, introductory. This is, this is stuff uh, I know, or at least I used to know. Um, uh, and it has, I, I've just told you, well, I, I included for you the quick proof of the Hopf invariant one problem. I've talked to you about the relation with Riemann surfaces and spin structures, the classical algebraic geometry. Um, and that sort of build up to the next one, which is going to be um, have similar features, but more complicated, where a lot of things are unknown. And because a lot of things are unknown, um, I, I'm going to be talking about not just the covariate in one problem, um, and not just about the predicted planes here, but by, by a larger collection of spaces uh, called this magic square, uh, in which the predicted planes that we mentioned here form the first row. It's a four by four square, so it's symmetric. So it's four rows, four columns, and the first, and they have dimensions which are all going up by powers of two at every step. So the first row, the real, real predictive plane, complex predictive plane, Cotonian predictive plane, Cayley plane, and dimensions 2, 4, 8, 16. Coming, then you, the next row, everything is doubled. Next row, everything is doubled again. Everything again. The last one in the right-hand corner has divided in 128. So there's a beautiful collection of manifolds whose dimensions are all powers of 2, which will in some sense grow out of the planes, and they are, uh, well, hopefully related to this covariant problem, 
Uh, that's, that's the conjecture. I mean, I'll explain to what, what, in what sense they're related. But whether or not they're related, I'm going to tell you about them. Because they're rather fun. And some of them are turn up in other places as well. And one of the things is they bring in the exceptional Lee Drew uh, in a very beautiful way. That's why the first magic square of Freudian Tower was first introduced. Um, and it's a way of, if nothing else, learning a little bit about some of the exceptional groups in relation to elementary geometry. Um, I, I don't really understand the exceptional groups myself. E6 I'm fairly friendly terms with now, uh, because I, I studied that, I shouldn't say, the second row of that mat for my four matrix is one I studied uh, in paper with someone else some years back uh, for uh, uh, another geometrical problem. So I know about the second row. I don't know very much about the third and fourth bits of the matrix I'm trying to learn. And I think what I've been working on is some way of trying to connect that 4x4 four four square with the covariant variant problem and possibly break it all through the proof. But that's the pie in the sky at the moment. But whether or not that works, the ingredients are all interesting. And if I can't tell you anything else, I can interest you in some rather nice bits of mathematics. Okay, I'm going to stop there. No questions? You want to, maybe I should ask you the question. You want to answer everything? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have time to, between now and Monday over the weekend to work hard. Uh, you can ask the question on Monday. Uh, by the way, can we uh, have a copy of this slide? Ah, ah, ah. Uh, I might need to correct them first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I need to think a little bit about it. But, um, but I'll, yeah, I'll give it to you. Yeah. But I think it should, the, the, there should be the correct version. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so for this uh, uh, surface with different spin structure, yeah. right? you have this function, quadratic function. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, in that case, you have all this result. Yeah. And is there analog in the case? Uh, so in this case, uh, spin structure related to W2 equal to 0, right? Well, that is always zero. It's a spin structure that's yeah. twice the true value. So, so uh, how about if you look at the case for loop space, that would be related to first point judging class now. Is there analog of that? Ah, good question. Um, uh, you see, so let's go back. A manifold is a spin manifold if and only if W2, assuming it's oriented, right. if and only if W2 is zero. And if it is zero, then it may have many number of spin structures. And the number of spin structures depends on the first cohomology mod 2. Uh, because, uh, so if the space is simply connected, and it's been, it'll be unique. If the space is not simply connected, it has, a choice, it has this interesting family. For it. Now, the loop space, uh, the part of the Eigen class, uh, the original manifold, gives, tells you whether the manifold W2 is 0 or not. Uh, then the, the first cohomology of the loop space is related to H2 of the original manifold, isn't it? Yeah, but well, uh, the question is, uh, let's say you want the direct operator on the loop space. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Then I'm you need the first conjugate class of the base manifold. To yes, zero, I know. Right? So, so I'm so going on and asking, what, <coughs> how many spin structures would there be more than one? Yeah, that and, would be. And I think uh, that will correspond, it should correspond to H2 of the, is that the very long way around? H1 of the loop space? Yeah. yeah it's yeah. H2 of H2. the H2 of the manifold is usually quite interesting. So uh, you, you, would, you could have some corresponding theory with H2 playing the role of each one of the Riemann surfaces. Yeah, good, 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 good question. Ex good exercise with students. Is it related to maybe the Rocky film? That, I mean, on four manifolds, then you have a lot of H2, and then you may be the two. Well, Rocky theorem is, is, of course, uh, related to the spin index theorem for spin manifolds. That's what we mentioned, four, manifolds of four. This is a, uh, of course, I don't know what, you know, in final fine dimensions, I know what it means for a manifold to have dimension congruent to two mod four and mod eight. The infinite dimension, I'm not quite sure what that means. So <laughs> uh, the Dirac operator in loop space is something, of course, that physicists like do. But, um, and the, in ordinary dimensions, ordinary fundamental space, the Dirac operator has different properties. In other words, it's self-adjoint or not self-adjoint, real or complex, depending on the dimension of the space. But in the loop space, I don't know, probably there are subtleties which will distinguish different versions of, the, of these things in, I haven't thought about that, so it's possible. 
And it may be one of these mod two anomalies that people like Whitten like will turn up. Um, yeah, so it could, great. and of course, again, the only things of interest are the ones which are stable under deformation. Yeah, well, I think between now and Monday, you can let me know what you find the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it is a good. I mean, you need, I think, 15 minutes to decide whether it's a, whether it's a sensible question or, or not. And then, of course, quite a long time to answer the question. But just to find out whether it's, it's uh, survived the first serious test or whether it's one that uh, doesn't make much sense. But it, uh, first sight, it looks quite interesting. Anybody else have a serious question? Or, I mean, no, no. Uh, uh -huh. hmm? nobody, nobody else have any more questions? Maybe uh, next Monday. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh,